So, um, greetings today. We have the parable of the um, of the the well known parable of the prodigal son. Um, the um, what we really have though is a man who has two sons. One of them is a renegade son, but he repents and comes back. And then we have a, a resentful son. Um, and between them, that's a, that's a second son. We'll look at that. And then the, between the two of them is a rejoicing father who loves both his sons. And that's the heavenly father. All right. So now uh, what we'll, we'll, we'll do here is just a quick, you know, since the parable is familiar to you, and it's a very lengthy parable, let's just go to the opening scenes where there was a man who had two sons. Now Jesus, it says, tells this parable to the religious leaders and others who were convinced of their own righteousness, okay? And so they're the target audience, and that's why it's important to remember that. Because a lot of us identify with the first part of the parable, namely um, this wandering son who finally get, comes to his senses and comes home. And it's a beautiful part of the story. But the real goal is to look at that second son and see what doesn't happen and what does happen. All right. So let's not forget that the audience that Jesus had were the audience of the they were self-righteous in the sense more in the more literal sense they believed they could be righteousness on their own following of the law and so it's not just the pejorative self-righteous but rather uh it's it's the more literal they really thought they could be righteous by following 613 rules right? and uh, if they did it um they were good and they were in the others these were the great unwashed so to speak and uh, so the Lord wants to address this kind of parable to the religiously righteous. And uh, look, there's nothing wrong with those rules and things, but, you know, they're kind of ma majoring in the minors. You know, they're more worried about what goes into a person's mouth and all the kosher stuff than what comes out of their mouth all day long, you see. Um, and so we, we, we need to see that's the intended audience. Okay, with that in mind, there is this man who has two sons. Now, the younger son, I said to the father, look, I, 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 you're not dropping dead, old man. You're not just not dropping dead fast enough. I, I want my inheritance now, and why don't you just give it to me now, and I'll get out of your place. I don't want to be with you. Uh, I don't want to be in your household. I want to be free. Uh, so pay me the inheritance now, and I'll just be on my way. Now, what, this parable is filled with shocking things, culturally speaking. At the time of Jesus, and even in many places in the Middle East, no son would ever get away with talking to his father like this, you know. You know, the father could literally have the guy, you know, honor killed. I'm not saying, hey, it's a great thing. I'm just going to say, we have a visitor here. I'm just going to say that we have a, um, a very shocking thing that simply was almost unthinkable. And yet he does it, and he says it. So with that in mind, um, with that in mind, we, we see that that's the first really shocking thing. His father gives him the money, and, you know, he goes off to a distant land. Now, this parable does not make light of sin. He goes off to a distant land, and he squanders his inheritance, you know, um, on a life of debauchery. Hmm? And um, it doesn't make light of sin because in this squandering of his wealth, he loses everything, and he also sinks so low that he's looking up to pigs. He says, man, they eat well compared to what I do, you know. I mean, that's really low. <laughs> and there's a lot of cultural stuff there because remember for Jewish people, pigs were very unclean animals, which, which they are. I mean, but they were talking just also ritually unclean. So it's awful how low he's sunk, okay. Coming to his senses at last, he says, I will arise and go to my father. I will arise. I'll go to my father. And that, by the way, that word arise, it's the same word that's used, you know, for the uh, resurrection, you know, basically uh, anastasis, you know, to, to stand up again. Uh, so it's the same verb. It's just noteworthy. And now, so the, he returns and goes to his father. Now, there's a lot of cultural things that are about to take place that are, again, very, almost unthinkable. This man, the, the father... He's obviously a wealthy man. He owns land, and apparently, you know, it's implied a good bit of it. And he's therefore, you know, a noble. Uh, he's in the noble class. He's the, um, you know, and they had a dignity, you know, to maintain. And um, so we see that while his son was still a long way off, his father caught sight of him. And that means he was looking for him. Oh, what a beautiful thought. That's the heavenly father Jesus is talking about. 
You know, when when Adam sinned, God came into the garden and had that plaintive cry, Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? You know, God said, I know what they did, and you know, just let them go to hell. He, he came looking, and he cries out for Adam, by extension Eve. You know, he cries out, Adam, where are you? Never forget that beautiful cry. Hmm? There were consequences for their sin that came upon them, but the Father never stopped loving or looking for Adam and Eve, when, even when they sinned. Now, of course, God knew where they were, but this call, he's saying, where are you in space, somewhere in, in this garden? But rather, where, where's your heart? Your heart went off my radar. You know, where are you now, Adam? Where are you? What's become of you? All right. So you see, now we get back to this. You have a father also. He's, he's looking, and, and when the sun is still a long way off, he says, you know, wow. And he comes, he starts, and then here comes something really incredible. He starts to run. Now, what's interesting about this is that rich or noble men wouldn't run because this, running in that culture uh, was uh, kind of a symbol that you were either in flight <laughs> because of a crime or, uh, or your enemy, from your enemies, which uh, was a very, um, you know, um, debasing, or that you were a servant or a slave on an errand. And um, because it, rich men just didn't run, they, they, took, they, they walked gracefully. Now, the other thing about it is that he, in order to run, because remember, they were long, long garments, he had to gird his loins. That is to say, he had to pull up his, his garments and tie them tight with the belt. And that's what it means to gird your loins, like roll up your sleeves, right? It means be ready for work. It's a symbol of readiness for work, or in this case, to run. And it, it was considered disgraceful for a rich man to show his legs. Now, my legs are disgraceful to show too, <laughs> even though I'm not, even though I'm not rich. But um, I will say that um, these are, you know, culturally like, wow. I mean, what kind of a father is this? He he lets his son just take his money and run, and his, his own son, his own son tells him, in effect, drop dead, old man. He gives him the money, and then he's looking for him to return. And when he sees him, he debases himself by girding his the goings of his garments and running. Rich men don't do this. It's beneath their dignity. Now again, you see Jesus saying, this is what my father is like, you see. He's the God of all heaven and earth. He could say, look, you sinned against me, never darken my door. He doesn't, see. He's looking for us, especially when we stray. So we see here this um, remarkable picture of the father. And of course, you know, with the son returns. Now, again, fathers didn't accept sons back who would disgrace the family. I mean, once again, culturally, this was not an unheard of, but it was very rare. And so the fact that he welcomes him back, and not just secretly, or says, well, come on in, and we'll let you live in the servants' quarters. We'll somehow take care of you. He's done very publicly. He has a big celebration, a great feast. Um, all these things are part of the story that are really kind of shocking. So, and we miss a lot of that because, you know, well, because we live in a different culture. So, you, you, we've already learned then a lot about the, the prodigal or the renegade son and the father who's rejoicing at his return. We're going to turn in a minute to the other son, but just to wrap up a couple of things. This son, renegade son has done a terrible thing. He's disgraced his family. He's shocked the town. He dishonored his father. He's he spent his money and squandered it on prostitution and, 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 and all kinds of other debauchery and and has completely debased himself. So again, let's realize he's done a very serious thing. And um, but the father loves him and welcomes him back. See? So how about you? How about me? First of all, are we willing to understand that the Heavenly Father is like that? He's not just up there angry and trying to keep us out of heaven. He's trying to get us ready for heaven. He loves us so much that he sent his own son to come and get us ready for heaven. You know, not bad. God so loved the world, you know, John three sixteen. All right. So we have to adjust sometimes our understanding of the Father. See, um, we're not able just to walk into God's presence in our present unseemly state because He's God. Utterly holy, 
the light would be too bright. We're not, we're not adjusted to that bright light yet. We, we need time, see, to come to our senses and rise and return. But the Father's always welcoming us and waiting for us, and he'll get us ready to, say, to see him one day face to face. Now then, also, we, of course, then are called to be that for others. Now, I realize it's not always possible to live in peace with everybody. And sometimes we need to keep boundaries because people have really hurt us or people we love, like our children or some, someone. We're not God and we're not all powerful. But on the other hand, we're still called wherever possible to imitate this. That forgiveness is very, we're quick to forgive. And um, if we can live in peace and restore the relationship, yes, it's not always possible but it's certainly something for us to learn from. Now, we have then the first son, the renegade, who came to his senses and returned to his father, and he, he's got that speech, I'll be a slave. He said, no, I'll hear nothing of it. He, put, he, he restores his son, he puts a ring on his finger and a robe about him. That's a restoration of his sonship. Beautiful, see? Now, um, we've got the first son back. Hallelujah. But there's another son. And he's outwardly very obedient. There's no sense in the text that he's ever told his father to go, you know, you know, to, to just go away. I won't do what you please. So uh, we see that, um, you know, he's outwardly uh, obedient, outwardly reverent toward his father, and so on. But there's something wrong in his heart. See? So when he hears, first of all, the fact that he's off on the land somewhere else, that could signify that, you know, he's... Um, you know, out there taking care of his father's business, I suppose. But it says to me, he's distant from his father. And this unfolds in the story as well. So when he, he hears that his renegade brother has returned, he's angry. And especially when he hears that the father's having a party. And he grows angry and sullen, stands outside and won't go into the feast. Hmm. And his father, this is get unheard of. The father comes out and pleads with him. He says, my son, your brother was dead and has come back to life. He's lost and now he's found. We have to celebrate. He's, and he, he pleads with him to come into the feast. And the second son will have none of it. He's angry and resentful. And the way he speaks to his father, listen to this, shows you the, the deep, bitter root that was in his heart. He said, look, I... I, I slaved for you. Slaved for me? You're my son. Everything I have is yours. I mean, we do this together. See, but I slaved for you all these years. I slaved for you. And I never disobeyed one of your commands. Hmm. Commands, all right, well. Okay, but you know, ideally, if we're in a good relationship with the Father, it's not so much his commands. Yes, we need commandments, but we're going to be keeping them because we love the Father. And we don't resent them, we're glad for them, you see. I know we sometimes struggle, but you get the idea. You know, it's not that we're keeping the law because we have to, but because we want to. Because we love what the Father loves and who the Father loves. And we want to please him. Okay. Now, he's not, we're not done yet. I mean, this son then goes even further. He says, all these years, I've done this, I've slaved for you, I never disobeyed one of your orders, and you never even gave me a kid goat to celebrate with my friend. Now, just stop the tape. The goal in life is not to celebrate with your friends. It's to celebrate with the Father. Wow, this is not on his radar. He wants to celebrate with his friends, you know. And he said, you never even gave me a kid go. And then this rotten son of yours, won't even call him his brother, returned after squandering your property with prostitutes, and, and you kill the fatted calf for him. Wow. He says again, son, we have to celebrate. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. And the story ends. Parable's done. Why? Did he change his mind and go into the feast? Did he hear his father's pleadings and have his heart melted and go in and celebrate? Or did he stay outside sulking, resentful? Doesn't say, does it? Because here's the answer. You're the son. I'm the son. We have to answer that question. Will I live my life so as to celebrate with the Father and enter heaven on the Father's terms and heaven on its terms? Will I 
allow the Lord to so form me that I love what God loves and who he loves. And he loves things like forgiveness and mercy. He loves things. Yes, he certainly loves chastity and obedience. Yes, he loves those. He also, again, loves mercy and kindness, love of one's enemy, and so on. But the question is, if that's what heaven is about, is the kingdom of God, with all of its values, where the Father is, and the Father is who he is, and loves what and who he loves. The question for you and me is, are, does that fill us with joy and delight, or are we sometimes resentful? He forgives people I don't think he should forgive. Um, you, know, you know, he loves people I don't think he should love. I can't stand that person. You know, God can't possibly love them. So are we going to be outside like that son, kind of resentful that a father has two sons and he loves them both? And they both need his love. Is he going to, are we going to be resentful of that? Or are we going to accept the kingdom of God and the father on his terms? Hmm. That's why the parable ends. Because remember, Jesus addressed this parable to those who were self-righteous, to those who were righteous on their own sense of themselves and despised everybody else. And um, he's saying, you know, outwardly you all are very obedient, but you're majoring in the minors. You're, you're focusing on things that aren't unimportant, but they're not as important as love, forgiveness, and mercy. Jesus elsewhere said to them, look, you are all technical about all this. You tithe mint and cumin and dill and all these things. You know, you tithe all this stuff and you, you know, keep all the records. You, you, you do that. Right? But you forget little weightier matters of the law, things like justice and mercy and so on, he lists. He says, now, now these other things you should have done, I'm sorry, sorry, these greater things you should have done without neglecting the others. See? But we tend to kind of reduce holiness to a manageable thing and we check off the boxes. But Holiness and love and so on, these are open-ended. And if the love of God, which is in us, because it's a supernatural virtue, not just natural human love, which often fails and has its limits, it's supernatural love. And if that's beginning to really live in our heart, you see, we're not just checking off boxes anymore. Yes, we can do that. But we know that those things are equipping, empowering, and enabling us to do greater things, like even love our enemy. <laughs> Even love your spouse, because <laughs> there's a lot of tension in families. Okay, well enough said. We'll we'll end this here. But what a powerful parable! And the fact that it doesn't end is because you and I have to end it. And how do we see the Father? And how do we understand heaven and the kingdom of God with its values? And remember, this is not making light of sin. God would be lying to us if He said sin is no big deal. It really wrecks us and it wrecks our lives and the lives of other people. God, this is not making light of sin. But that's why we need mercy in abundance, boatloads of it from God and having received that mercy to share that mercy with others. And I know there comes a time when we have to say, no, not this time. But it's for the good of the other person, not because we're just angry or go away, leave me alone. It's, it, we, we, we're really committed in our heart. I, I got to stop helping this person destroy their life. And we're heartbroken to say no, but we do because we love them. See, that's different. So this isn't just, you know, carte blanche. People can stomp all over everyone else and then just kind of be welcomed back. It's not that simple. I understand. But if there's a reason that we have to take someone and incarcerate them, uh, in, you know, in our prisons or jails, or even our family, we have to say, you know, we can't let you stay here any longer. Um, we, we need to make sure that we're doing that because we love them. And there's a lot of mixed stuff, I get it. But more and more, as we make this journey with the Lord, if we do say no, we're clearer and clearer to say that no in love and in a way that will really and truly help the person. All right. So I know all the whatabouts, whatabouts that might come up in our mind, but at the end of the day, we're going to need a lot of grace and mercy on the day of judgment. And the Lord says, look, if you've shown mercy, you'll receive mercy. Blessed are the merciful. They shall obtain mercy. The book of James says, merciless is the judgment on the one who's shown no mercy. Oh, you know? Well, 
I don't know about you, but I'm going to need a lot of grace and mercy on the judgment day. <laughs> and uh, I hope that um, you you feel the same, because God's very holy. And he's going to need to do a lot of show a lot of mercy and grace and do a lot of work on our hearts to get us really loving and desiring the things he's actually offering. All right, well, listen, God bless every one of you for listening. And this um, was one of the most powerful parables, right? And don't miss that second son, because a lot of us are that second son. Amen.